you know, if you're not focused on the right thing during these times, right, it can become overwhelming. But, but here's the good news, right? We can escape being submerged in all that madness, right? At least twice a week, we're given an opportunity to come here in the church, right? To get away from all that nuts, all that craziness, right? To come and rest in some peace, right? A place of rest, a place of peace. We have a friend as close as a brother, right? Further than a mention of his name. So whether you're, you know, here, obviously, but also out there. So even when we're in the madness, right, he's promised to give us his peace. And he gives us his peace overwhelming. So let's drink up. Let's drink up. <laughs>
just the voices. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh Lord. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. As you're turning over there, again, I want to remind you about Friday night. And you'll want to tune in Friday night as we follow Jesus. I'll give you a hint. It's an exchange between Peter and Jesus that had a profound effect on Peter's life, but also has a profound effect not only on our life, but literally everyone who hears about the power of forgiveness that can be found in Jesus' name and how we can extend that to other people. And not only does it benefit those that we forgive, but it has literally, it, the Lord heals many people when they extend forgiveness to uh, those who have been hurt, those who have hurt them. That's Friday night. And so it's going to equip us to not only uh, receive forgiveness, but also extend forgiveness. And I think it's going to have a profound effect. That's Friday night online at 7 p.m. as we follow Jesus on Fridays. Or Friday night with Jesus. I've got to remember what I call these things. Friday night with Jesus. Uh, now, now listen. Next Wednesday, Mark is going to be teaching. Looking forward, uh, what he's going to do. He's been. He was supposed to teach a few weeks ago, but other things happened. But he is going to take us through Genesis chapter six. One of the more interesting chapters in the Old Testament. One of the more interesting chapters in Genesis chapter six. And so he is going to come up here. He shared some of it with me uh, before the service. We're in for a great time. I'm looking forward to it, praying about it. Can't wait to do that. But tonight we are in Acts chapter 4. I've entitled this chapter, A Spirit-Filled Defense. So let's offer this Bible study to the Lord. Jesus, we love you and we just thank you that we have you, our very best friend. You truly are, as the... As the they said, as close as the mention of our name, and you are a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and we thank you for that. And Lord, when we live in an ever-increasing hostile world, we know that we are not on our own, and we are not alone. You are with us to the very end of the age. And you fill us not only with your love and with your mercy and your power, but you also fill us with boldness that we are able to face our adversaries when confronted and face obstacles and circumstances that tend to overwhelm us, and we are so grateful for that. So, Lord, as we look into this great truth tonight, we ask that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand what you, the Spirit, would say to us the church. And tonight, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit and boldness, Lord, that we may be able to shine your light brightly to a world that is becoming darker and darker and darker. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is, I believe, the key verse for all of uh, the book of Acts. And as I said, people are saying it's still being written today. I agree with that. It's the Holy Spirit writing uh, God's love letter on our heart to be lived out publicly and boldly and courageously. But Acts 1 and 8, Jesus made a promise to his disciples before he had ascended to heaven, but ye shall receive power. That word power is explosive, miraculous power when the Holy Spirit comes up on you and you shall be witnesses to me. So Jesus made a promise. He said, I am going to enable you with explosive, miraculous power that when the need arises, you will be able to be a witness concerning me, a witness of me, literally a witness to me. And so the first time this happens, Acts chapter 2, it says that the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. They began to speak in languages that they had never learned, they had never studied, maybe even never been exposed to. But the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. And it was a sign and a wonder to all those Jews who were there in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. 
In chapter 3, we're, uh, Peter and John are on the way to the temple. And I believe, again, the Holy Spirit fills Peter and gives him, manifests a gift of faith. The faith for what? To believe that a lame man who had been lame for over 40 years could be healed. It takes a special gift. I mean, the gift of faith that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 12 is to get, I, I'm just going to make it simple. It's the gift to believe God for the impossible. Do you have any impossible things in your life? Do you know that the Lord will give you the faith to believe him to do it, to complete those things, the, the gift of faith? And it was the gift of healing. And then it was the gift of miracles because he began to leap and jump and run and praise God. And so this all came from the filling of the Holy Spirit. Here in chapter 4, again, it's going to say that Peter was going to be filled with the Spirit. Except this time the Holy Spirit doesn't manifest through tongues, and he doesn't manifest through faith or healing. Maybe faith involved, but not healing or miracles. He is filled with the Holy Spirit, and he speaks the word of God with boldness. I think it's good to remember that the Lord baptizes us and gives us the power of his Holy Spirit to meet a specific need, to meet a specific challenge. And it could look different every time because Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit, who is God, distributes the gifts uh, according to his will. Otherwise, he decides whom he will put place them upon and when the occasion arises and what need needs to be met. And I think it's, we don't want to get caught in the trap that the baptism of the Holy Spirit looks one way for everybody and one way every time. And I just don't think that's what the book of Acts teaches. So here we have Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit, and we'll see that. And it says that he spoke the word with boldness. So what I'd like to do before we get into the narrative is just, first of all, divine, uh, define boldness. As the Holy Spirit uh, filled Peter, and he spoke the word of God with boldness. The word boldness means literally free in speech. Otherwise, Peter did not hold back. He was not reserved. He did not feel restrained. He began to open up his mouth and speak. Again, as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance, free in speech. It means fearless confidence. And as we see that the Holy Spirit needed to come up on Peter and John for what they were facing. And that's something that you and I can take encouragement in, that when it is necessary, we have at our disposal the power of the Holy Spirit that we don't have to be restrained in our speech, but also we can be fearless in our confidence. The confidence that God is for us and not against us. And my favorite part of this definition is that boldness also means not only free in speech, fearless confidence, but cheerful courage. I like that one. Otherwise, this is not a somber moment. And even though it is, the context will seem like a somber moment or a very tense moment or very uh, full of angst and anxiety, but the boldness that the Holy Spirit wants to give us when we have obstacles and circumstances and we are confronted in a very hostile environment, that we can be cheerful in our courage. And if you really want to drive the devil mad, be cheerful in courage. Never let him see you sweat. Not like that. And guess what? You don't have to do that on your own. The Holy Spirit enables us. So again, before we read the narrative, I'd like to read the three verses so you can mark them in your Bible to see where this boldness is given to Peter and John. The first one is verse 13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, untrained men, they marveled. They marveled at the boldness of Peter and John. Their cheerful courage, their fearless confidence, their freedom in speech, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 29, now, Lord, this is a prayer they were praying, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that we, they may speak your word. It's very interesting, we'll look at that tonight, the, the prayer, the object of their prayer uh, what the petition of their prayer, what they were praying. They were praying for boldness. They wanted to be free in their speech. They wanted to have fearless confidence, and they wanted to have cheerful courage. And finally, in verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Please pay attention to this. And they spoke the word, not in other tongues, not a word of faith, not a, a word of healing or of miracles, but they spoke the word of God with boldness. 
And I love that about the Lord. I love that I'm not the owner, I don't have ownership of the gifts. I love that I don't determine when the gifts are used. I love that as I walk with the Lord, I can lean upon him and he determines when and how and what gift he wants to manifest uh, through me and through you, all of us who are born again. And here in chapter four, there is a need for Holy Spirit boldness. Holy Ghost boldness and courage. So in verses 1 through 3, we find out that Peter and John, they are on Solomon's porch. They had just healed the lame man, or the Lord did through them. And it says uh, that the lame man was holding fast to Peter and John. Otherwise, he's not letting them go. And people, Luke writes to us in chapter 3, have come in from all directions because many of them knew who this man was. He laid at the temple gate daily. He's more than 40 years of age. They knew something divine has happened, and they are coming from every direction. This is no small commotion. And what should have been a time of praise and glory to God, which the lame man was, by the way, but this actually became a time that the, the Sanhedrin, and we'll look at who they are, took advantage of this opportunity to arrest Peter and John. And it says here in verse 1, Now as they spoke to the people, that is Peter and John, concerning the miracle that just happened, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. Uh, the Sanhedrin's made of the Pharisees, which were the minority. They were the traditionalists. They held to the literal trend, uh, interpretation of the Mosaic law. Uh, but the Sadducees, which were the majority, and the chief priest, Annas and Caiaphas, who had a joint priesthood at the time, they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in angels or spirits. They were rationalists. They took every Old Testament miracle and contributed something natural phenomenon that had taken place. And so they were also materialists. They didn't believe in, the, again, the spirit world. They lived for the here and now. They were the liberal, spiritual liberals of the day. Where the Pharisees, even though they had, were in apostate mode at this time, at least they held to the literal interpretation of the scriptures and they held on to the tradition of the Sanhedrin very, very tightly. And so this lame man being healed was bad doctrine for the Sadducees. This is because they didn't believe in this stuff. And so, but something had happened publicly that nobody's going to be able to deny. So they knew that they had to uh, uh, quench the rebellion, this re spiritual rebellion, this uprising that was about to take place. And again, they seized the moment of the opportunity. They were not really trying to stop Peter and John because of the miracle. So what did they stop him for? It tells us in verse 2, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Again, this, this guy is a bad doctrine walking out before them. It showed them to be, uh, what I believe to be, con artists that they were. And so they knew that they had to stop this. That is the centerpiece of the gospel message. It's the cornerstone of the gospel message. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose the third day. And so we know that. And so that's why, that's why we know the resurrection is real, because why would the disciples live the way they lived if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead? They were willing to put their necks on the line, so to speak. And many, all of them, but John, were martyred for the faith. And so they did this because of the truth of the resurrection. And do you know that's what's happening in our culture today? It's, it's not the miracles. It's not the healings. It's not even the, the biblical teachings of how we should uh, conduct ourselves. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The spirit of this age wants to silence the gospel. And so there's confrontations that are going to happen, not only on a national scale, but to us as individuals that the enemy wants to silence the gospel in you. The enemy wants to stifle the message of the resurrection. And it says here in verse 3, and they laid hands on them, which literally means they treated them harshly and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Remember, Peter and John were going to the temple for the afternoon prayer, the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So by this time, it is evening. So they just arrested them and put them in jail. And so they could deal with him the next day. And then Luke writes something very interesting. In spite of Peter and John being arrested and the commotion that was going on, 
In, in, in spite of the Sanhedrin trying to silence Peter and John and stifle the message of gospel, it says here in verse 4, Luke starts off with, however. In spite of the persecution, or maybe because of the persecution, many of those who heard the word believed. And so it could be that in spite of the persecution, the church continued to grow. Or it could be that people saw right through the Sanhedrin, knew what was going on, and that made them want to hear the gospel even more. Do you not see that happening today? The more that any person or any local, state, or federal government tries to stop the church of Jesus Christ, they may think they have been able to. They may actually you know, bar the doors. They may actually uh, forbid the assembly of the saints, but you're going to find out that more and more people are going to be attracted to the message because they are able to see through what that government is trying to do. And that's exactly what's happened. You know, Jesus made a promise to us, the church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome the church. It doesn't matter what's being said or what's being done. The gates of hell shall not overcome the church. I saw, <laughs> I saw a picture of the church out in California by pastor by John MacArthur. And, you know, he has about 3,000 on Sunday. They had literally 6,000 people come to service because they were told that they could not meet. And Pastor MacArthur got up and said, welcome to Grace Community Peaceful Protest. And there was just an eruption um, a Calvary Chapel in Thousand Oaks with Pastor Rob McCoy. He, the, he, the judge made a temporary restraining order forbidding them to meet as a church. And also the restraining order included one, up to 1,000 John Doe's. Otherwise, up to 1,000 people would be cited with a misdemeanor as well as the pastor. They met Sunday. And more and more people, they came from different states and told Pastor McCoy, we'll be one of the... Uh, one of the ones that gets cited so your members don't get cited. You see what's going on here? And it's, it's not just people being drawn to it. It's the Holy Spirit is not going to let the culture or the world or any government stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. It may not look like we want it to look, and we may not be able to meet the way we want to meet, but the Holy Spirit is ready to fill us with boldness so we can stand up for the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. And so the more they persecute, were persecuted, the more people came to faith. That's just 5,000 men that for whatever reason in that culture, they didn't count women and children. And so 5,000 men plus women plus children. And the great thing about men being saved is that they become the leaders in their household. They become the men that God wants them to be. They start loving their wife as Jesus loves the church. They start uh, being a role model and not just a playmate with their children and leading them to do righteous things. So when a man gets saved, you can count on the family following. It's not always easy, but the family follows the man. That's the way God designed it. And so it's, I just find it interesting. The Sanhedrin is trying to stomp the gospel out, trying to silence and muzzle the gospel. So what does the Holy Spirit do? Okay, I'll send 5,000 men to get saved, plus their wives and their children. And you can't stop the church of Jesus Christ. You can't stop the gospel message. And so here in verses 5 through 12, Peter and John, it's the next day now, will come before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was made up of the chief priest, and of the, the chief priest was a Sadducee, and then the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders. They make up, and there's 71 members of the Sanhedrin. It's very hard to get them all together, but the way this reads, apparently uh, this is something that was enough to get them all together present there for this trial. And it says, it came to pass in verse 5 on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, which were mostly Pharisees, the conservatives, the traditionalists, the ones that believed in the interpret literal interpretation of the scriptures, as well as Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, John, and Alexander. Now Caiaphas and Annas were a father-in-law, son-in-law. Annas had been appointed by the Jews. But he fell out of favor with Rome, so Rome deposed him and set up his son-in-law Caiaphas to be the high priest. But the Jews didn't like Caiaphas. They wanted Annas, so they ruled together. And basically what you have is a mafioso family 
Let's take one. These guys were thugs. They were murderous, deceitful, idolatrous thugs. And they were apostate. There's not a redemptive bone in their body. And they're the ones that are ruling over, literally over the civil and spiritual life of Israel. And they're both Sadducees, by the way. So Jesus walking, you know, being raised from the dead against bad theology. A lame man being healed is bad doctrine. And the idea that Jesus rose from the dead is really causing, is a thorn in their flesh. So Ianus, the high priest, and Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, as many as were the family, the high priest. Again, this is mafioso thugs here. We're gathered together at Jerusalem. F.F. Uh, F. Bruce says this is like the Supreme Court and the Senate uh, being convened. Uh, this is how powerful and influential this body was to the civil life and spiritual life of Israel. And verse 7 says, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? And now this is a very leading question. This was a question of entrapment. We never see that on Capitol Hill, do we? Where they try to trap you with a question. And the, what, you know, what Caiaphas or Annas, we don't know which one was asking the question, but the high priest, uh, probably Caiaphas because that's who Rome recognized, is asking this question. He's wanting Peter to just flat out say, well, we did this in the name of Jesus. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 5 says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams causes you to worship any other god, he is to be put to death. So he was wanting to say, because they looked at Jesus as not just a miracle worker, they looked at him as uh, an idol or another god to be worshipped. And according to Mosaic law, if they did this in the name of any other God but Jehovah, they were to be put to death. It would solve all their problems. And sometimes it's very easy for us to be entrapped by the wicked counsel of the world. You know, Paul told the Ephesians, and I'm just going to paraphrase it for you, the wiles of the devil means that the devil's cunning like a fox. He's shrewd. He's ambitious. He's cold. And he, know, he studies, he studies the ways of people, and he knows our tendencies, he knows our quirks, he even knows our uh, fallacies and our weaknesses, and he loves to find a way to ensnare us. He loves to find a way to trap us and us to do something, say something that will actually soil our testimony, compromise our testimony, or get us off the field and put us on the sidelines for a while. And so it says, and they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power, by what name you've done? And look at verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. You find it interesting, no coincidence here. There's a leading question, a question of entrapment. Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. You can never outfox the Holy Spirit. You can't outwit him. You'll never win a chess match with him. You'll never get a victory over him. He, he knew, the Bible tells us he knows the origin of our thoughts. <laughs> Think about that. He knows the thoughts from the beginning before we ever thunk them. He, he knows that, right? He knows that. And so it says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit. So you could say this is the gift of discernment. I think Peter knew exactly what was going on. And you say, well, you know, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the Apostle Peter. I know we make fun of him sometimes and how he, you know, foot in mouth disease. But this is after Pentecost, by the way. Uh, but Peter's still an ordinary man. There's a total transformation in his life before Pentecost and after Pentecost. It's two different things. In the Gospels, we have to remember none of the disciples were re, uh, reborn or regenerated. They weren't born again. They were followers of Jesus, but they didn't become born again until after the resurrection. And so he has not been born again in the Gospels, and he's definitely hadn't been empowered by the Spirit uh, coming living in him and coming upon him in the degree of power that we see here in the book of Acts. But here he is, he's reborn. Here he is, filled with the Holy Spirit. And we say, well, didn't that happen in the book, uh, Acts chapter 2? Yes. But, you know, you've heard it said, and I think it's, I don't think, I think it's good. I think it's good theology. There's one baptism, but many fillings. There's only one day of Pentecost, but there's many fillings. You've heard it said, you know, Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 5, be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. Be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you want to uh, 
boil it down to a nutshell, put it down in a nutshell, he says, look, daily you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And somebody was asked one time, well, why do we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily? It's because we leak. We leak and we need another filling of the Holy Spirit. And so here he is. He's speaking in another language in Acts chapter 2. He is given the gift of faith and healing and miracles in Acts chapter 3. And now he's experiencing the discernment of God through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And even though you may not see yourself as Peter, remember the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. Why? For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. That's Luke 12 and verse 11. So when we face a confrontation, when we're having to give a defense for what we believe and why we believe it, you're like, well, I can't, I can't be like Pastor Rob McCoy. I could never do what he's doing. Or I can't be like John MacArthur. I can never do what he's doing. Or I can't be like Peter. I guarantee you that Rob and Pastor MacArthur and Peter, the apostle, will tell you that the Holy Spirit gave them the right words at the right time to speak against those who had come against them. And it may not be a government that comes against you. It might be your employer. It might be someone in your neighborhood. It might even be a medical report that comes against you. And the Lord can give you the right words at the right time to meet a specific need. And he'll keep us from, uh, so we shouldn't worry, what are we going to say or how are we going to deal with because the Holy Spirit is with us, and he fills us. And it's in the passive tense. Remember you saying they're filled with the Holy Spirit? It's always in the passive tense, meaning it's not something we do. It's something that he does for us, and he does it according to grace. And he does it according to our faith in him, and I love that. So then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, and really I think Peter is enjoying this, Because nothing is more exciting than to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to be a vessel for our God. What an honor. What a privilege. We don't go look to pick a fight. We don't look to go stir up dissension. We don't look to argue or debate with people. But neither do we want to shrink back when we have the privilege and the honor of being a mouthpiece or being a vessel for the glory of our God. We're nothing more than empty vessels. And he fills us with his spirit that we might shine his light to a world. And when you think of it that way, that when I am challenged or I have adversity in my life, it's my opportunity to shine the light of Jesus in this situation. And we can be, know that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit and know what to say and even how to say it. <laughs> because you know how it is. Sometimes we say the right thing at the wrong time. Sometimes we say the wrong thing at the right time. And sometimes we say the right thing at the right time the wrong way. <laughs> so you, you, so you, we're one of the three. And sometimes it's really been all three at one same time, right? But you can say the right thing at the right time in the wrong way. And so, but the Holy Spirit teaches us what to say, when to say it, and my favorite part, how to say it. And so here we can depend on him to do that. He says in verse 9, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, all we did was help a man become independent in his life. Just think about that. That guy for 40 years had to be bathed, had to be dressed, had to be fed. Possibly. Uh, He couldn't go make, the only living he had was to beg. So he had to be carried or drugged to the temple gate, sat there all day long. So was he, did he have the ability to have children? I don't know. Was he married? I doubt it because he had no way to provide for them. So they took a man who was totally dependent upon somebody else and made him a free, independent person. And this is called a good deed. And Isaiah says this. He said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Those who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And that's exactly what's going on here. They were trying to spin this to make it look like what they did was an evil thing. 
And it was something that was not to be enjoyed, but something that should have been a bitter pill for everybody to swallow. So Peter said, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, notice he, he's not denying Jesus. He's just he's saying it at the time the Holy Spirit wants him to say it. First of all, he puts the deed out there so everybody knows that what we did was a good thing. And then he says, it's not by our power, the power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, reminding them, this guy's not dead, he's walking around, and you know it. And by him this man stands here before you whole. And then he says, he quotes Psalm 118, verse 22, in verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other for there is no other name under heaven given among men for by which you must be saved. He said, what Peter did is he turned around and said, you guys are trying to reject the one that can not only heal this man, but can give you everlasting life. You are so foolish to reject what we are offering you. And the message of the gospel is offensive to people. Because it's a message of exclusiveness. It's a very narrow-minded message. It's considered bigoted. It's considered sexist. It's considered homophobic. It's, well, it's actually, it's considered xenophobic, if you ask me. Because it's a message where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. I like what Greg Laurie says, and you'll have to think about this. He said, there are many ways to God, but there's only one way to heaven. And that's where our culture is today. I remember hearing years ago, I went to a youth conference and listened to Josh McDowell talked about that one of the signs of the times, as we're going, going closer to Jesus Christ coming, is the sin of intolerance. The sin of intolerance is when I do not fully embrace your ideology or your theology or your worldview as equal to mine. Used to be we could say, well, you think different than I think, but I can still accept you as a person. I can accept you as a man or as a woman. I still respect you and honor you and value you as a person, but I reject your theology or I reject your worldview. But intolerance says the moment you say that how I see God and how I see my life and how I have a worldview is not equal with yours, then you are the one that should face the consequences of whatever, losing your job, lo uh, having your, your home pillaged, uh, maybe even costing you being incarcerated, whatever the case may be, marking you as someone that society has rejected. And, and so the gospel, the gospel is a message of exclusiveness. There may be many ways to God, but there's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John chapter 10, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers. There's no other way to come to the Father except through Jesus. He is the door. He is the gate. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And they hated, they hated that message. They hated everything about it. And yet Peter says the same God, that's the same way that this man was saved, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, is, uh, heals the same way you, you must be saved. He's preaching a sermon to them. And I wonder if they realized it or not. But they'll never be able to stand before, they didn't stand before God and say, oh, I never knew. Oh, yeah, no, no, Peter preached that sermon to you and let you know. And the Holy Spirit did it. And the Holy Spirit brought Psalm 118 to mind. The Holy Spirit, in just a few minutes, will bring Psalm 2 to mind. And that's something that we could rely on, that as we walk with our Lord, as we're in communion and fellowship with the Lord, when the need arises, he will fill us with his spirit. And you can even quote scripture that maybe it's something that you have not remembered since Sunday school or something that maybe I've said uh, many weeks or months ago. You haven't thought any more about it, but all of a sudden it just comes out of your mouth like, who said that? <laughs> who said that? Where did that come from? And, and, you know, and, you know, Peter didn't say, well, now Psalm 118 verse 22 says. No, he just quoted the scripture. And the Holy Spirit does for that, does that for us. He just, we open up our mouth and he speaks with us with boldness, with freedom of speech, with fearless confidence and a cheerful courage. I love that about the Lord. Now look at verse 13. After hearing Peter says this, 
they are now about to threaten them. Now, when they saw, verse 13, the boldness of Peter and John and perceived, <laughs> geniuses we have here, and perceived they were uneducated, which means they literally, I mean, uneducated means illiterate. Uh, they didn't know their ABCs. And untrained, they had never had formal education. Uh, they marveled. They were just astounded at this. They looked down upon Peter and John. They were Galileans. Again, they were looked at as the hillbillies of the day uh, because they were blue-collar workers. They figured that they were, you know, they had never gone to uh, higher, never had a higher education. They had been formally trained as the Pharisees and Sadducees had been trained. And so they looked down upon them, and they couldn't believe the boldness of Peter and John. Well, the boldness didn't come from Peter and John. It came from the Holy Spirit. And so the first misconception is that you have to have formal training and you have to be literate to be, to be a spokesperson for the Lord or to do anything for the Lord. That's the first misconception. The second misconception here is they realize that they ha had been with Jesus. Well, that's partially true, but they're speaking in the past tense. They're still trying to relegate Jesus to the Gospels, yet Jesus is not in the Gospels anymore. That's a historical record of what he did on earth. He's still very much alive today. Not only had they been with Jesus, but they were still with Jesus, and whether they knew it or not, Jesus was in the room with them. Think about that. And that's good for us to remember. No matter what adversary you are facing, no matter what challenge or circumstances that are trying to just wear you down, you, my friend, are not alone. Jesus the spirit of Jesus is with you. Here's what Jesus said to his disciples. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Remember Paul, he ended up in jail in Jerusalem. After the Jews, his people tried to savagely murder him because he shared the gospel with them. And he was in jail, and Paul thought, this is it. I'm not going to fulfill my calling. Jesus had called me to stand before Caesar and preach the gospel, but now it's going to end here. And it says, that night, I think it's Acts 23, Jesus was in the jail with him. He'd always been there, but revealed himself to him and said, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid, Paul. For as you have witnessed to your countrymen, you shall also witness to Caesar. Think about that. Paul told Timothy right before he was face execution at the hands of Caesar Nero, he was in the maritime prison, which was literally a hell in earth. And as he's there, he wrote to Timothy and said, you know, everyone's forsaken me. Only Luke, the physician, is with me. But yet I'm not alone. The Lord is with me. And I want us to understand that Jesus was very much in that room. And he was standing against the Sanhedrin and standing with Peter and John. Jesus opposes those who oppose his people. It doesn't matter how powerful they are or how influential they are or how wealthy they are or how unlimited, quote unquote, the resources may be. If Jesus be for you, then who can be against you? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And what the Holy Spirit does for us is that he actually reveals to us the presence of Jesus in that situation. We have never spent one moment of one hour or one second of our Christian life alone. He will never leave us, he said in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, nor forsake us. Isn't that beautiful? He'll never forsake us. He'll never look down and say, wow, wow, this is pretty bad and you haven't been living right. So um, wash my hands of you. I'm done with you. He, Jesus tells us, he, or Paul tells us rather, he told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that God knows who are his and he will never disown his own. Never. Think about that. And I, I just think it's beautiful. And so in verse 14, so they had these two misconceptions. There's a bunch of illiterate hicks 
who don't know what they're saying, and they also had been with Jesus past tense, yet they're just marveling at the boldness, the freedom of speech, the fearless confidence. I wonder if Peter and John were just smiling the whole time. Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. Just wait for it. Wait for it. You'll see. Just wait for it. You know? And it says, verse 40, And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, so they, they, they had a dilemma. The guy they healed is kind of an eyewitness testimony. Oh, yeah, that was me. Yeah, I was the one that was lame. Again, bad theology for these guys, bad doctrine for these guys. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, the notable miracle had been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we can not deny it. What they were saying is that we cannot spin this. The truth is out there. It's undeniable. Now, something interesting, I, I think it's interesting. I don't know for sure, but it says here in verse 15, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So how does Luke know what was said in, among the Sanhedrin? Well, we are told in Acts chapter 6 that many of the priests came to faith in Jesus Christ, so they could have been a part of the Sanhedrin council. But it's also thought, and there is good evidence, that Luke learned this from Paul. Paul who was Saul at the time, was a part of the Sanhedrin. And so he would have been in this council, listening to this, devising for six ways from Sunday how to get rid of Peter and John, and then he met the line of the tribe of Judah on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. So whether it was Saul, who was part of the Sanhedrin, that gave Luke this testimony, or the priests, the number of priests in Acts chapter 6 who had come to faith in Jesus, but it's interesting They lock everybody out so they can talk among themselves and come to find out the whole world is still talking about what they said. What do we do with these men? What are we going to do with them? So verse 17 says, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. And that's just a tactic of the devil. First of all, he tries to uh, reason with you. Then he'll try to manipulate you then intimidate you, then persecute you, and then if he can, he will try to destroy you. And I think that's just a pattern that continues on to the day. First of all, it's just reason with you. Let's have a reason. And the devil does it all the time. The devil don't mind you going to church. Just don't be fanatical about it. You know, just don't go, don't let you, don't exclude yourself from your family. You know, don't, don't take every word literal. Uh, the, what, the, what the pastor is saying or what the Bible is saying. Just don't, don't get crazy about this. And maybe some of you heard that from your family members. So just don't go hog wild. I don't know how that fits in with the gospel, but don't, just don't go crazy with this. And so he reasons with you, and he tries to you know, sugarcoat it and manipulate you. And that is work he'll try to intimidate you. Let us severely threaten them. Oh, that'll do it. And then, then we'll persecute them. That'll happen in Acts chapter 5, and then we'll kill them. And that's how the devil works. So we have a showdown here, beginning in verse 18. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But, don't you love that? Verse 19, Peter and John answered, and this is an immediate answer, and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. Peter and John made an instantaneous decision that obeying the law of God supersedes the law of man. They did this, by the way, by the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired them to say this and gave them the fearless confidence and the freedom of speech to do it. They didn't think twice about it. They, whatever, threaten us, severely threatened means severely threatened. And they're like, nah, 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 nah. What else you got? <laughs> they know they're going to do that. Verse 24, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We know what we have experienced. John said it this way in his first letter. That which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, and have looked upon our hands of touch concerning the word of life, we bear witness to you. So they're saying, look, we cannot ignore what's happened to us. We walked with him. We saw what he did. We touched him, not just before his death, but after his death. 
The reality of the resurrection of Jesus is so real to us, we can't help but follow him. And that's what it should be for all of us. That we should encounter the risen Christ in such a way that we'll never be ever to do anything else. And the Holy Spirit will enable us to see him in his resurrection power and also speak up when necessary, no matter who the adversary may be, what kind of bully he may be. Because it's actually the Spirit working behind wicked people. And it seems so overwhelming to us. <laughs> Verse 21. I, I, just, I wish I could have been in that room because when they said that, so whether we obey God and man, you decide. But we cannot help ourselves. We're going to obey God. And it says in verse 21, so when they had further threatened them. So there had come a moment like, that's not what we expected. (laughs) What are we we supposed to do? Let's threaten them some more. All right. They let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old, whom this miracle of healing had been performed. So Peter and John are released. So what do they do? Do they go lick their wounds? Do they go breathe a sigh of relief? No, they went back to the fellowship of believers and held a prayer meeting. Verse 23, and being let go, they went to their own companions. Listen, I know you guys get this. Those who are watching get this, but never underestimate the importance of the fellowship of believers because they are our companions. We have a fellowship of believers where we stand with one another, we pray with one another, we defend one another, we're for one another, we encourage one another, we help out one another, and when necessary, we forgive one another. It's because we love one another. It's a precious thing that the Lord has given us. He has given us a church family. And so never underestimate the power of fellowship. That's why, and it's not so much where we live, guys, here in Florida, but all across the states, there are states where it's forbidden for people to worship inside or to have any people uh, over a certain number meet together or people to sing or to hug or to shake hands or have no touching whatsoever. And and it's, it's insidious. It's evil. It's manipulative, and it's the reason is, is because our adversary understands the power of God in the fellowship of believers. We need to understand, and never take it for granted. Again, that's what I believe happened. They tried to shut down the gospel, so 5,000 men got saved. You know what's really cool? I was listening to Pastor Dave Rosales of Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley. He and another Calvary pastor and their wives traveled up through Oregon and Washington and Idaho and Northern California. And they found, uh, of course, the cities are having their problems. But they found a lot of places where the word of God is being preached and people are being ministered to. And there is peace taking place. And even places like Portland and Seattle, there are now movements where Christians are coming in and holding worship services and baptizing new believers. And people are being healed, and people are being turned to the Lord. And so it always reminds me of Romans. This is where uh, sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And where darkness abounds, the light of Jesus Christ comes in. And I think we, we must remember that. But never underestimate the importance of fellowship. Yeah, there are times when we're sick, or there are times when we, that we can't be uh, in the main sanctuary, but we have the internet. Thank God for that. But listen, never underestimate the power and the importance of the fellowship of believers and being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, what did they do? They raised their voice to God. They begin to pray. Spiritual battles are won when God is first and foremost the object of your prayer. And notice that they prayed. They didn't protest. They didn't storm the gates of the temple there at Jerusalem. They didn't go to the headquarters of the Sanhedrin. They went to the Lord and pray. And I'm not speaking out against, uh, you know, standing up for our rights, but I, find, I just find it very, very interesting that the first priority before we do any other activity is prayer and praying together. They raised their voice to God and that God was the object of their prayer. And they, they began with not their petition, but with recognizing who God is. And you're right, Mark. A hamburger may not be, is not awesome, but God is awesome. And so many times we, we start, we pray, and I'm not con, you know, condemning anyone, but we pray with the big problem that we have. 
And sometimes we can end up finding ourselves the problem getting bigger and bigger because it's weighing on us as we're talking about it to the Lord. But wouldn't it be better to do what these guys did, begin with the greatness and majesty of God? Because when you make him first priority, talking about how awesome he is and how great he is, that problem just kind of shrinks to the point of, eh, no big deal. They raise her voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God and made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them. Which one of these Sanhedrin never did that? Really? What did they ever do that God did? Who by the mouth of your servant David had said, here again, he's using Psalm 2, the Holy Spirit gave this to them. Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? That's a very important verse because David later would say, Many are the plans of man, but the Lord's purpose prevails. It's a vain thing they're plotting. Your adversary is plotting your demise, and it's a vain thing in the eyes of God. Which means it's useless, it's empty, it's futile. Because God knows his purpose for your life. We need to remember that. Many are the plans of man, but the Lord's purpose prevails. I have to remind myself of that. I need you to remind me of that, and I need to remind you of that. Many are the plans of man, but the Lord's purpose prevails. Why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things, empty, futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, all the spiritual forces, all the powerful forces here on earth were gathered against Jesus to do away with him, to do whatever, verse 28, your hand and your purpose determined to be, for, to be done. You know what's amazing about the crucifixion of Jesus? It didn't catch God off guard. He determined it would be done. There's nothing that your adversary is going to try to do to you that God didn't know about before they did it. In fact, I believe, as I read here, that God wants to, has determined to take what your adversary has meant for your downfall to turn it around for your good and his glory. I believe that to the depth of my soul. So as much as I get agitated by what I see going on in the world today, God's not caught off guard. The world is not spinning out of control. Actually, everything is falling into place at the direction of our awesome, sovereign, mighty, all-powerful God. All of it. That's why we can have a cheerful courage. Yeah, God's got this. I'm not, I'm not talking about a phony cheerfulness. It's you know that you know that you know. You don't like how you feel. You don't like what's being said. You don't like the pressure. But you know, if God be for me, mm -hmm, then who can be against me? If he would not withhold his own son from me, how much more will he give those things which I need? Think about that. I love that. God's like, I'm not surprised. You guys are just pawns. You're just mere pawns. You're not even a bishop. You're a pawn. The Bible says even the most powerful kings on earth, that their heart is a water course in the hand of our God. He directs it as he decides. Verse 28, to do what of your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. And so Peter's saying, you guys think that you're a genius, bunch of geniuses here that you're going to silence John and I, and you may kill us, we'll receive our reward, and the gospel will continue. You can't overcome the church. Another reason why the church can't be here in the tribulation. Verse 29, now, Lord, it says, look on their threats. Now, they move from praise, and they're now moving to petition. Now, Lord, look on their threats. They're not ignoring the threats. They're not ignoring the, the circumstances. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. You know, worshiping the Lord, first of all, as you worship him, you begin to see who he is and that he is with you and that there's nothing that he won't do for you. But it also gives you a strength that's unbelievable, an inner fortitude, a tenacity, a determination, 
to see that thing through. By stretching out your hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Again, I go back to, I believe that when we do this, the Holy Spirit is the one that enables us to pray big, holy, audacious, mountain-moving prayers. Not feeble-minded prayers, not timid prayers. I'm talking about audacious, mountain-moving prayers. Stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed... The place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with free speech, fearless confidence, and cheerful courage. Boldness. A number of years ago, I was with a friend of mine, Rocky. We were down at a pastor's conference in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And man, these guys love the Lord. And after the teaching that I did, we had a prayer meeting with them. And those guys prayed. They prayed with such fervency, prayed with such desire. And literally, it felt like that place was shaking because of the way they were bombarding heaven with their prayers. And that whenever I read this verse, I think about that day. I don't know where those guys are today. I don't know what's happening with those pastors. But that day, you just knew that Jesus was in the room. And you knew that Jesus was directing his shepherds, what, they, what he wanted them to do. And I thought, what an awesome privilege to be a part of something like that. And do you know what an awesome privilege that you and I can be here tonight or watching online tonight? That this is a night that the Lord wants to fill all of us with boldness and fill us with the confidence that he is in control and that we are able to pray great things for him to do. And notice that they didn't pray that they would escape persecution. They didn't pray for their own comfort. Nothing wrong with praying for the Lord to make things comfortable. They prayed that they would have boldness. Boldness. That's what I want. I want boldness to face adversity. Because in my natural man, I don't like it too much. Like, I, no, I like comfort. Yes, the God of all comfort. I love that verse. The God of all comfort. They prayed for boldness. And I believe that's what the Lord wants to do for all of us tonight that are watching or here tonight. He wants to fill us with his Holy Spirit so that we could boldly speak the word of God. And then finally, here, verses 32 to 37, after all the um, harassment, all the threats, what did it do? Basically, the church continues. <laughs> Don't you love that? And the church continues. Now, the multitude of those who believe were of one heart and one soul. That's actually the fruit of the Spirit, where they had that harmony, that oneness, that fellowship, that communion. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Look at verse 33. And with great power, that's Acts 1 and 8. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection, which is the heart of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Great grace. You know, grace means the undeserved, unmerited favor, but grace also means the power of God. The great grace was upon them all. The power of God is a gift of grace to us, is grace to us as the church. Now, nor, verse 34, was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and, saw, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed, otherwise the common sharing of their wealth, as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, that was a nickname that he was given. Joseph is his name, but because of his attitude and his nature, the boys nicknamed him Barnabas. And, you know, if you're going to give me a nickname, I want to live in such a way that's something that's flattering to the Lord, right? I want something that's flattering to the Lord or magnifies the Lord. It just reminds me that as a Christian, as a man or as a woman who loves the Lord, let us live our life in such a way that when people speak of us, it is a way that flatters the Lord according to our character. Also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. He was an encourager, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So these people were just overjoyed about what the Lord was doing. And so in their generosity, they did something that is not found in the Bible. They decided to sell everything they had and put it into a common pot to be distributed as need. I think their heart was right, but it's going to end up leading to problems because they did something in the emotion of the moment. We're in there this evening. The Holy Spirit 
Look, we get emotional with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit helps us to think through things. And the emotion of the moment, they say, hey, you know what? Let's do this. Let's have communal living. We'll have a communal pot, uh, and, every, and we'll distribute it as everyone has need, and it's going to wreak havoc in their life. And it is to be a reminder that the Holy Spirit helps us to focus on that which we find biblical. Don't make um, uh, decisions based on the emotion of the moment, but upon what the God has to say about that. Amen? Father, we come to you tonight, and we just thank you that you desire daily, Lord, to fill us with your Holy Spirit for the need that is present. And Lord, you don't mind us asking, and Lord, we do in faith, that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit that we may boldly confront the culture of our day, boldly be able to confront the evil of our day. And Lord, it's all going to be on different levels for each of us, but we want to boldly live our life for you, boldly speak the word of God. And so, Lord, we ask you to empty us of anything that's not useful to you. It may not be sin. Sometimes it is sin, but it's something that's just not useful to you. But to empty us of that and fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may boldly live this life. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for your knowledge. We thank you for your discernment. We thank you for your faith and your love and your strength. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a family, a family that's bound together in love, that, Lord, we would never underestimate that. We would always cherish it. And, Lord, we also say thank you for that we live in a nation where we can freely assemble and freely worship you and freely minister with one another. And, Lord, we know that there are some states that are having that freedom. Lord, that is, they're trying to silence it and take it away. But we know, Lord, we know that you are on the throne and in control. So we pray for them. And at the same time, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we do have in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a great Wednesday evening.